All right, it's two after here. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, greetings to everyone who's joining us today and to those who are watching on the recording. Uh, thank you for taking the time to uh, join us on the training session today and learn some more about teleport. Um, I posted in the chat, but please refer to our code of conduct throughout the uh, session today. Uh, feel free to stop me at any point to ask questions in chat or the q and I'll do my best to answer them um, and really uh, ask anything that you need. Let's let this session be about you as well. Um, so today's session is teleport onboarding session number two, joining resources and access deep dive. We're really going to get into now that you have a teleport cluster, if you joined us on session one, uh, you've got some basics of how to get things joined. You've tested out some features. Um, you've connected your single sign on. Uh, we're going to really join or take a look at how you should roll out and join resources at scale. Um, and take a deep dive into RBAC and some of the strategies there that can help you going forward with some enterprise uh, RBAC rollouts. And again, just a quick review of the agenda today. Uh, we're going to start with a, an overview of some of the concepts we covered in session one. We'll try to do that quickly, but help set the stage for today again. Uh, we'll cover all the advanced joining options and all the different tokens that you can use there. Uh, we'll cover each resource type, servers, Kubernetes, databases, apps, and desktops, how each of those are joining, the similarities and differences between them. And we'll wrap it up by, again, diving into some advanced RBAC strategies, looking at how you take uh, attributes and claims from your SSO and all the way through teleport to providing user access in a uh, templatized manner. So we'll kick it off with the session one review. Uh, if you were there for session one, this will look very familiar. This is an overview of the Teleport Cloud architecture, where you can see how it leverages um, Global Accelerator and, and DNS in order to provide low latency access across um, all regions um, with multiple proxies and the auth service located um, next to DynamoDB and S3 for your session recording and auditing. Um, I won't dive too much into this, review session one if you want to hear more about it. The key I wanted to point out for today is that we have in the bottom right hand corner there, we have nodes, desktops, apps, databases, and Kubernetes. Those are the five protocols that Teleport supports today, the five different types of resources you may be interested in joining outside of some of our more advanced features like uh, machine ID, which we'll cover in a later session. Um, so the focus of today is really going to be around those five primary resources and how you get them to connect to that proxy. Again, this is a image that you saw from the first session. Don't feel like you need to squint and try and read each little line there. The take home of this is the overall flow of a node join. On the left hand side, you see the teleport node. The right hand side, you see the teleport auth server. In a node joining situation, the node sends a valid short-lived token, cloud identity, or some sort of um, off-server challenge, proving that it is, in fact, um, a resource that should be joining your off-server. The off-server validates it, sends back a host certificate. The node receives the host certificate, and from there is then able to heartbeat back to the teleport cluster, letting it know that it is still actively connected. And then that host certificate um, authenticates it as a proper resource and allows it to help validate the user connection and user certificates are valid as well. This image um, shows you how some of that connection to the proxy actually happens and how a user actually forms that connection. The real key to take away from this is that as a Teleport Cloud user, all of your resources are going to be joined through the Teleport proxy via a reverse tunnel connection. So that Teleport agent running any of the five services for these five major protocols will connect over an encrypted tunnel to the Teleport proxy, establish a reverse tunnel uh, for the return traffic, and all user connections are um, using MTLS to the proxy and then ride that encrypted tunnel to the agent from where they can access the resources. Uh, so this reverse tunnel system really allows you to have secure access while also only requiring outbound connectivity. It punches outbound from the firewall as long as the allowed related comes back, which is a standard um, firewall configuration. It will allow that connectivity um, without requiring any inbound ports be specifically open for teleport. 
And if you joined us for our first session, this will also look very familiar to you. This is how you can join your first resources. We have an option called Enroll New Resources. It has two different flavors. You'll see some of them have guided next to them. Some of them just link you to the documentation for the getting started with them. Um, this can be great for getting off the ground, testing out your first resource. Some of these do lead into more manageable or complex ways to join, but some of them are meant for your initial enrollment. And then looking ahead, you're going to want to leverage some of our advanced strategies. For example, we saw that when you clicked on enrolling a server, an Ubuntu server in this case, you get a command that you're going to execute. It automatically is creating a short-lived token, which we'll go over in a little bit, for you underneath the hood. Um, it's great if you're trying to quickly enroll resources here, but if you're trying to programmatically or enroll resources at scale, um, you're going to not you're going to want to find different methods probably rather than having to rely on the fact that clicking the web UI generated the token for you. Uh, this script uh, doesn't allow for a lot of customization. So it's a, a great way to get started, but not the tool you're probably going to end up using long term as you look to roll out to many servers or many agents. So let's go ahead and move from then to the basic joining into what are now some of the more advanced joining options that you can leverage as a teleport user in order to join your resources. And we covered this slide uh, previously in session one. This covers all the different methods that uh, can be used by teleport in order to join resources. Now, as a teleport cloud user, it is worth calling out that the first method listed here, the EC2 identity document, and the fourth method listed here, the Kubernetes service account. Those two are not supported in Teleport Cloud. You cannot use them. The EC2 method requires auth server IAM permissions. You don't have access to the auth service. Uh, the Kubernetes service account uh, permissions require running the in the same Teleport uh, cluster or the same Kubernetes cluster as your Teleport cluster, which again is also not supported by Teleport Cloud. So those two methods are not available to you today, leaving you with the four remaining uh, joining methods or tokens that are a join token. That's a very basic one. We'll start there. Uh, IA, AWS IAM, Azure Managed Identity, and GCP IAM all leverage the cloud provider credentials in order to join. So between these four methods, you can find a way to join resources in any environment. And at the same time, some of the major cloud vendors might uh, provide you a way to join that's a little more seamless and a little less uh, complicated. So let's go ahead then and dive into some of the common themes that you'll see across all, all technically six methods, but again, as a Teleport Cloud customer, all four methods that will apply to you. Common join option themes. The first thing to start with is all join options require some form of what we call the token resource. This can be created with TCTL create our TCTL tokens add commands. This can be done with TCTL create on a, uh, a token resource like kind token. So there are plenty of ways to create these tokens. These join tokens do have an expiry. So all of these tokens have a predefined TTL or can have a predefined TTL to determine when they are going to expire and no longer be valid. Some like the join token we'll start with, you're going to want to have short lived because the token itself is considered a secret. Some like your IAM tokens or your cloud provider tokens, they might not want to have uh, any expiry on it because the name of the token is actually non-secret. The authentication mechanism is driven by your IAM credentials. So as long as those are valid, you might not want to have that token change for ease of rejoining resources. Cloud users can create tokens, uh, as I described, using TCTL with a TCTL tokens add. You can use do that either by, there's actually a direct tokens command or a file that you can use to create. And as with any dynamic resource that you can create with a file, you could also leverage our API or our Terraform provider in order to create join tokens. 
a single token can support one or more resource types with a commerce separated list. What does that mean? We talked about the five protocols in a token. It'll be defined, I believe, as roles. Of those five protocols, you could support all five with a single token. So desktops, databases, apps, Kubernetes, servers, all can be combined into a single token if that agent that you want to join will have multiple teleport services. All services have to be listed on the join token or that service will not work on the agent. So for example, if we look at this uh, picture in front of us, you'll see the teleport agent is running two teleport services. That could be the Kubernetes and the, eh, not usually Kubernetes, let's say databases and applications. Very common to co-locate those together. Uh, it could be, if it's running both of those services, your token will need to specify that it is valid, not just for databases or apps, but valid for both with a comma separated list. And so that is some of the common themes that you'll find across tokens. And the, every joining method we describe in going forward will leverage one or more of these token types in order to join. So we'll start with the most basic of joining methods, which is a manual joining using a join token. As a cloud customer, you can't create static tokens as you could on the off service and self-hosted, but you can create dynamic join tokens in the example you see on the screen in front of us that's using the TCTL tokens add command to create a short-lived five-minute token, the output of which would be considered a secret. So the invite token, as you see here, is ABCD123 insecure, do not use this. And that is because that the token that Teleport will provide, or you can override an input one, for example, if you're trying to sync up some sort of automation, you can predefine it, but that token value is a sensitive secret and should be treated as such. Because that is a sensitive secret, we recommend using short-lived tokens and rotating these tokens regularly. You can create longer-lived tokens using the TTL flag. There is no hard upper limit um, for example, you can get up to years. However, the token is, again, considered a secret and Teleport's recommendation would be to find a much more short-lived and dynamic way to generate these when required or for short amounts, short periods of time, rather than relying on that token remaining secret for over a year. Last but not least, it's worth pointing out that the at the bottom there, you can see how this token is used in a configuration example. The auth token, is the token that will be created and provided. And then the proxy server would indicate your teleport cluster. So that would be once the proxy or once your teleport cluster has the token created inside of it, you will then be able to use this in the Etsy teleport.yaml of your agents or in the start commands if you're using that way. This will be the token that will provide you access. Again, this is considered a secret. It should be short lived, it should be rotated. So for those of us who might not have resources in a major cloud vendor, you would like to try maybe automatically joining using a join token. Um, this can work and work well, but it does become a bit more complicated as you think about trying to have a, a current but short lived join token available at all times, especially since the token must be securely stored so that it's not just an available secret out there for somebody to use and join resources to your cluster. A common method to accomplish this is to write a script or cron job that would execute on an interval. Um, it could reach out to our API, it could use TCTL, but essentially that script or cron job creates a new token and then publishes it to a secret store, something like a vault if you're on-prem, um, AWS Secrets Manager, things like that, where it would be accessible to new nodes that are spun up and Part of that new node spin up script then will have to be able to pull down the valid join token, put that into their parameters or use environmental variables to inject it and be able to join using that token. In this way, there'll always be short lived tokens and you don't have to have a long lived token and you can join outside of any major cloud provider. As you can see though, that script and cron job needs to be able to create this token. Uh, it does require having valid credentials and you should look into using our machine ID tool, which can join in a 
cluster, create short-lived credentials. We'll go more into that in the next session. But that machine ID tool would be a valuable tool to use to keep that script and cron job ready to execute, but also on short-lived credentials, or else you simply have to create uh, a long-lived uh, certificate or credential for, for the script manually or um, automated. And it's, it's just going to become you know, a pain. Otherwise, if you create long-lived there too, you've kind of caused a, uh, a security circus, as we would say. Um, no real or security theater, no no actual security because you still have a long lived credential at the end of the day. One that actually would probably be um, worse to have compromised. Um, and the overhead in setting up and maintaining the solution is what really drove us to find other methods in at least the cloud vendors where we can independently verify authenticity of the nodes trying to join. So this is definitely an option today. Great for on-prem, but it does require some additional setup and uh, what you'll see with the later methods, if you're in a AWS, GCP, Azure major cloud provider, you're probably going to want to leverage uh, our other token types. So when we look at cloud joining methods, we have the IAM method from AWS is available to teleport cloud providers. Main advantage of IAM joining is it requires no sharing no secrets. The token name, which was a sensitive value in the join token method is now considered a non-secret because what actually backs the authentication is what's configured in the teleport cluster for this token identifying what AWS accounts it could come from. You can restrict it by the ARN of the resource being joined. So by allowing the account and resource to be restricted, and leveraging the IAM metadata and permissions in order to validate that that resource is in fact from a permitted account, you no longer have to share a secret out in order for this to join. The name of that token can be baked into your user data process or baked into a hard-coded configuration that your resources leverage. Um, it can be used by our EC2 auto, dis or our EC2 auto discovery, which we'll talk about later, um, in order to set this up seamlessly. Um, and continuously. So the IAM method is very powerful in that sense, in that it's one of those tokens that can be, re you know, all tokens actually, and I should have brought this up earlier, can be reused as well as many times as you want while they are valid. So because of that fact, and because that it's a non-secret, you're able to let this live a little longer and be reused across the board and, and published much more simply. So again, and a quick reminder, only the IAM method is available, the EC2 method you see in the documentation will not be available for you as a Teleport Cloud uh, user. So make sure you look at the IAM, it'll leverage your IAM uh, configurations. And if we look over at the right-hand side, you'll see it's a pretty basic and that it has a name that you will reference in the agent, the roles that we talked about. The join method will be set to IAM and under allow, you can list one or many accounts and restrict it by ARN if necessary. So cloud joining methods for Google and Azure follow a very similar pattern. We have the same uh, availability to leverage their own uh, IAM and uh, managed identity credentials respectively in order to allow the same process of a non-secret name being able to be shared amongst your agents and the identification and authorization comes from the IAM or the managed identity credentials being provided by Azure and GCP confirming that they are part of the expected projects, locations, service accounts, subscriptions, resource groups. All of this can be restricted to ensure that your resources are joining from an expected area. So really didn't reinvent the wheel here for GCP or Azure. It works very similar, at least from a teleport configuration perspective. They will have some additional steps and um, approaches as you go into each environment. Recommend you look at the docs uh, for your environment if you're interested in using these token joining methods. And so that wraps up the four major token types. And you know, again, it kind of comes down to Dynamic tokens are basic, easy, uh, good for if you're not in any of the major cloud environments. If you're in AWS, GCP, or Azure, I would recommend looking at using our um, cloud-focused joining methods first. It'll probably be simpler in the long run for you to be more secure. 
So now that we're done looking at tokens, let's go ahead and now break down how these tokens interact and different methods for joining each individual resource type. Starting with probably what is one of our most popular resources as it is our oldest uh, servers. So how do you are joining typically Linux servers um, to the cluster? So when we join a teleport server, it happens to be a one-to-one -one relationship between the SSH service that you configure in teleport and the Linux server that will be hosting it. Unlike we'll see with other um, agents where you can do a one-to-many on the backend resource, you should have, if you're going to use teleport SSH server access, uh, you should have an SSH service running on each agent or each instance or server that you'd like teleport to access and it will need to teleport uh, binary installed upon it. While servers can join via the proxy or auth endpoint normally, because the auth endpoint is not exposed to teleport cloud, you will be always joining via the proxy service. So if you ever see anything in documents about the difference between joining to the auth service versus joining to the proxy, you as a teleport cloud customer are joining to the proxy. And Teleport servers can join via OpenSSH. Uh, so an OpenSSH server, one that maybe doesn't run the Teleport agent or can't have the binary installed on it, these can be uh, joined in Teleport, but it does have a few distinct advantages. You're gonna see limitations in what sort of labels can be applied, um, advanced features like enhanced logging, um, and network interactions are restricted. You, I don't believe you can, you can't, um, the users must already exist in the OpenSSH server. So there, that's just a small list of a few things where OpenSSH servers can be good to start, especially if you can't get teleport on there immediately. End of the day though, you're probably gonna be getting a much better experience with the teleport SSH agent installed and the binary installed on your servers. And on the left hand side here real quick, you can see a sample of a very generic SSH service, one that I actually run in my lab, where at the top is the piece we've already seen where you set the auth token, in this case an IAM token, the proxy server is set, I've enabled the SSH service, it's actually enabled by default. So if you're not running the SSH service, make sure you set it to no along with any proxy and auth service, I will also be explicitly set to no. And then here you can even see some of the labels that we'll dive into more in the RBAC section. I've got a couple static labels there and then some fancier dynamic labels, one that's running the host name command. And the one at the bottom is a, an even fancier one where I run teleport version and cut out the actual uh, version number. So I have a nice little label that says version in the currently running teleport version. Actually, it should say the one installed because it is going to run teleport version on the binary. So subtle difference if you don't restart the service after an upgrade, you will see it change, but you won't see, you won't actually be running that version until a service restart. So another thing to think through as we talk about joining teleport servers, as we're joining them at scale, we largely recommend baking this into a CI CD pipeline. If you're talking about hundreds to thousands of servers, you're not going to want to be managing this manually installing teleport, even pseudo manually. You're going to want to start looking at tooling such as Terraform, Ansible, Chef, or Puppet. These are very popular tools in order to manage both the configuration and the binary distribution um, onto new servers, though teleport today does have um, some auto discovery methods that can make that a little bit easier. Uh, another popular method is to use cloud init scripts to install generic teleport configuration as the resources are created dynamically. So you can use teleport, um, especially if you leverage our AMIs. We do have tooling that can allow you to pass in configurational elements that will build the teleport process and uh, configuration for you. Um, so you can leverage that as well to install teleport and get it configured across the board. Um, Last but not least, one thing to consider throughout all of this is we do recommend installing with yum or apt, if at all possible, as this integrates with our teleport automatic upgrades that will allow you to upgrade um, in the future or, not, or as you go forward, it'll allow you to upgrade your agents automatically, which is 
uh, the best way to really manage a, a fleet wide. So if you can use Yummer app, make sure you're using that out of the gate and uh, being ready then to consider a more advanced feature, which we can cover later in a further set in later sessions on advanced upgrading. The last thing worth mentioning around servers that we're going to see as a common theme for some of the other services as well is what we call the auto discovery service. This is actually a separate teleport service. So when we saw the resources, we saw an SSH service, we've seen a proxy service. Well, this is the discovery service. And while I can do other things in the context of server access right now, it can connect to Amazon EC2 instances, automatically discover and enroll them based on configured labels. Uh, it supports also Azure VMs today, and Google support is slated for our very next uh, version 13 release. So if you're watching this on a recording, you may have GCP auto discovery service available for you today as well. So it executes an install script on the discovered instances. Um, if you're using AWS, that's gonna be their AWS systems manager. That will install teleport start it and join the cluster. So it will actually, based on the configuration of your discovery service, install Teleport on your instances for you, the binaries and everything, again, leveraging generally, I think the YUM and apt repos, and it will install that for you. It will start the Teleport service with a generic configuration based on parameters that you've passed, and it will join the cluster. And so you essentially then can, as resources join, you they will join automatically if you're trying to enroll a large fleet, you can do that too, as long as your uh, token will accept that amount of time. So it's very easy to join large fleets. It's very easy to keep large fleets joined using this auto discovery service. Uh, it's one of our newest joining methods and very much worth checking out for your instance. Um, it eliminates any overhead of managing and enrolling new instances, both in the current and in the future. Uh, but it will not run if any previous teleport binaries or installations are on there. I think this is one of the most common uh, hiccups people will find is they've done some teleport testing. They manually joined a few nodes. They try and run the auto discovery service, but it will not run if there is already a teleport binary. It's part of the official script that we, or the default script, I should say, that we provide. And it will error out or bypass the instance if it sees teleport even is already installed as a binary on there. Uh, last but not least, that default install script, the one that um, in AWS Systems Manager runs, um, that is controlled or provided by Teleport as a default, but it can be edited and a different script can be provided. So if there is some sort of customization to the install needs of your environment, that can be controlled and configured to your needs. And so we'll take a quick peek at that discovery service again, because we'll see it uh, quite a bit. So this both shows you the AWS version on the left and the Azure version on the right. You can see the keys here. First of all, you see those three sections off. If you haven't seen that before, that's because the auth proxy and SSH service are on by default. Uh, so you need to explicitly enable them off if you're using a config file. Same thing with the join parameters, we've covered that. And the auth service, that'll be your teleport.sh uh, endpoint. But the real key is the bottom there, the discovery service, where you can see on the left-hand side, it specifies AWS. Right now, I believe we only support EC2 with this, so I'll have to confirm that. But in this case, it is only configured for EC2. Our regions are US East 1 and West, so it'll only join resources from that region. And you can see the tags we have with ENV and uh, prod. Same thing on the right-hand side, you'll see that we have the Azure section with the VM set you can limit it further by subscriptions, resource groups, and regions, and set tags for those instances. So that wraps up servers. Next thing we're going to move to is Kubernetes joining. So the most popular method to deploy Kubernetes is using a Teleport Cube agent so far. That uses our Helm chart example, and you can deploy it into each Kubernetes, excuse me, each Kubernetes cluster you desire to join to the Teleport cluster. So that Teleport Helm chart agent will be deployed into each cluster and supports multiple replicas. So you can achieve high availability very quickly using our Helm chart and Cube agent, which makes it one of the more advantageous uh, options. Uh, 
using our Helm chart also allows for easy configuration changes using the values file um, and version updates using the, the chart and being able to use a Helm update or upgrade. So it is a pretty simple process and usually aligns with a lot of the standard ways people are managing their Kubernetes clusters today. So it's very popular. A slightly less common option, I have seen it used, but not as often, is you can run the Kubernetes service on an externally running Linux machine. So you can abstract that Kubernetes service out of what is our cube agent, which would be running in the Kubernetes cluster, and bring it into, let's say, a Linux host that's external to it. This can be useful if you want to decouple your teleport deployment or your teleport Kubernetes service from the clusters you're managing. Let's say, for example, these are not clusters you have access to deploy an agent into. We can support that method. Uh, it does require, though, using a kube config file, or you have to dynamically set up these resources. And we'll talk a little bit more about dynamic registration later in the applications and databases section where it's a much more common practice. So those are the two methods for, um, well, actually, sorry, two of the three methods for Kubernetes joining. The third option is yet again, looking at the auto discovery service. So in this case, while we're still waiting for GCP VMs to be supported, um, we do also support for AWS, Azure and GCP, the Kubernetes integrations. So Teleport does not install any component on the cluster in this method, but it does require direct access to the cluster's API and minimal access permissions in order to provide that Kubernetes cluster connectivity. So on the right hand side here again, you'll see I've broken out that AWS resource instead of types EC2, we see types EKS set. So it's going to start trying to find EKS clusters in the regions um, and looking for matching tags. So that same auto discovery service that was used for the nodes can be used here for in, uh, adding Kubernetes clusters to your cloud environment. All right, since I don't see any questions so far, I'll go ahead and move along to databases and application joining. Why these are lumped together is because they happen in pretty much the same way. And most people who are using one will either co-locate or at least deploy very similarly with the other. Because the access pattern, unlike the servers, which was one to one, the agent, which was one to one, if you're using the Helm agent for Kubernetes, the database and application joining happens in either a one to one relationship. So you can deploy a database service if you're self, especially if you're self hosting on an, an instance and you want teleport to live right beside it. That's perfectly possible and you can deploy it for one. But probably a more common approach is using a one to many relationship where one database agent or one application agent provides access to many back end databases or applications that you're trying to provide access to thinking more along the lines of let me have a database service per account or a database service per area that can access a series of resources. So while it supports both, um, unlike the server access, this one also has the option for a one to many joining process. Um, while it doesn't make a difference for Teleport Cloud because you will always be joining through the proxy, these do also require joining through the proxy, unlike our server access where we saw you could join the auth service if you were a self-hosted customer. And on the left-hand side here, you'll see a, a sample of, again, a configuration showing at the top a, a very basic database service configuration to access an RDS database where you set up, at the top, I've set up dynamic resource access, which we're about to go over here in a second. At the bottom is a very static resource access where you can see I've just set my SQL very statically there. And at the bottom, you can see I joined a, a Jenkins app that's actually on the same server. That's why I'm using localhost as this teleport agent. So the small sample configurations there of database, adding a database in an application, those are both done statically in that they're both configured underneath the app service. Using or updating or adding them would require restarting the service and affecting connectivity through that agent which is why a more common, or I would say the better path forward for access, especially if you're not doing the one-to-one -one methodology, is dynamic registration. 
So what is dynamic registration in Teleport? It means we take what used to be a static configuration in the Etsy teleport.yaml file and update that. And that's how you get static resources like we just saw and take that configuration instead and push it into the teleport cluster and use it as part of the cluster state. So instead of my databases living on the agents configuration, they live as independent resources in the cluster state. And what does that mean? Well, because the database service or our app service, or as we saw even the Kubernetes service, because it no longer has the individual configuration of apps on it, it doesn't require a restart to add new apps or modify apps. So the dynamic registration workflow where you build these resources against your cluster state um, is a much more scalable way forward if you're going to want to be able to affect, adjust, and modify your teleport resources dynamically. So getting a little bit more into the specifics of how this works, on the previous example, you would have seen the static database configurations in each service or the app service. Instead of having each database that I want to join configured in my database service, we'll see what's on the left-hand side here, where I, instead of a database, I configure resources and labels. These labels basically identify which databases should be proxied through this service. So in this very basic example, star star, any database that I configure against my cluster backend will be proxied through this database service. That's determined by the configuration. This database service is joined. The cluster knows anything with any label should be proxied through that database as an option. And then on the left, the right hand side, you'll see an example of what a database looks like when it's built against the cluster state. It should look very similar to a token and it is controlled very similar to a token. You can use TCTL to create these databases or apps. Uh, you can use the API endpoint. You can use um, uh, the Terraform to create these. So all of these can be created using uh, various automation processes or scripting as well in order to keep these database inventories up to date. So dynamic registration is great if you have infrastructure that's going to be adding or changing constantly inside of like the same accounts. And you want to be able to proxy that through a shared uh, pool of teleport database agents. This allows you to write automation or manually add new resources, change resources, remove resources without having to go and restart connectivity every time. So highly recommend dynamic registration if you're registering databases manually and you have infrastructure that's going to change regularly. Last but not least, we have the options here specific to AWS and Azure for automatic database discovery. This is not the same as the auto discovery service. This actually comes as part of the database service. So the database service can individually run auto discovery of these two specific resources um, without requiring like an independent discovery service. So if you're running an AWS with RDS or Aurora, or you're running in Azure, you can have these databases auto discovered just by setting up these configurations that you see in front of you, very similar to the discovery service. It requires knowing what subscription or region or ARN they're meant to come from, having some sort of identification and tagging to restrict so you don't have to in include them all, which region they're meant to come from, and also restricting the type so you don't have to discover all databases. But unlike the Kubernetes and the server access where we had that discovery service, that does not run for databases. You can do that natively within the database service and have both AWS and Azure resources auto discovered. Last but not least, as far as the major protocols go, we'll take a look at desktop joining, joining some Windows desktops. Uh, there is two options for Windows desktop joining. You can use the non, well, let me start by saying that it does follow a similar pattern to apps and databases in that one desktop agent can provide access to 
many Windows backend desktops. So it's generally created on a one-to-many relationship because the teleport process cannot be installed upon the Windows machine without running emulation. And anyway, it's meant to be run on a Linux host that would provide you one-to-many access to your Windows desktops. So the more the easier method and the one you'll see in the getting started guide, I'd say, is desktops can be joined manually by specifying each host in the service configuration. So you see there that on our example on the right hand side, non-AD hosts, that's a simple Windows desktop host that's configured in the Teleport Windows desktop service. Um, and this manual method also a key to highlight is it does support automatic desktop user creation. So if that local user doesn't exist, you can create it automatically. Now, just like what we went through with dynamic registration of apps and databases, another similarity is that desktop support dynamic registration as well. So instead of having to put each host into the Windows desktop service file, update it, impact connectivity, you can create a label-based inventory of Windows desktops that can be updated via TCTL API. And we actually have a great example of that in our GitHub uh, repo if you are going to go down that route. Um, and Terraform, I believe we are supporting now for the desktops. Other than the manual joining where there is a or no Active Directory available, desktops can also be joined using Active Directory. So if your windows are part of an Active Directory, Teleport can join and find those windows aut services automatically. This allows Teleport to authenticate with Active Directory and provide access to local Windows users. So it can be great for the discovery, uh, especially if you already have AD joined, because then all your resources will show up. Uh, the one disadvantage I'd say would be we do not support automatic desktop user creation for Active Directory right now. So you would have to only be able to, or you'd only be able to access the local users upon that machine that pre exists. And that covers the major protocol joining. Uh, in the last section here, we're going to take a quick look here at advanced RBAC strategies and how you should start framing your conversations and thoughts as you approach Teleport RBAC. So the first thing to think through is what affects Teleport role-based access controls? How do I get my user access from my IDP? Which is really the key of what Teleport provides is a glue from your SSO provider all the way through to individual user resource access. So it all starts with the SSO provider, which will have be passing claims or attributes, depending on if you're using OIDC or SAML. It passes that to the Teleport Auth connector. The Teleport Auth connector will map those claims and attributes to Teleport roles. Those then Teleport roles can leverage the claims and attributes along with statically defined parameters to enforce logins and which resources are available. And that ultimately leads to the user access being granted to them on SSO login through the auth connector, through the role, and then being applied to the teleport user. And then their access to resources restricted based on either static definitions or claims and assigned to them from what they had in their identity provider. So as you think through, how do I get my permissions or my identity provider information to provide functional teleport user access patterns. These are the auth connector and the teleport role are the two big pieces. And then obviously you're applying that role to a user. So let's take a look. One thing I wanted to remind you if you're on session one, you'd see this. This is a key configuration for a basic super admin role. You can see the key there is that under a specific role I have, I've done roles, resources, and verbs. By setting star star, I know this role can access any management resource required. The default editor role is also a good role for this. If you end up not having a super admin role, but you've kept the default editor role unaltered, uh, using that editor role or a super admin role like this can be great for if you break access with your SSO. Make sure you have this ready and assigned to a local teleport user before you start making SSO and RBAC configuration changes. Because if you do something unexpected, you break something you didn't mean to, you drop a role from your own user that you didn't want to, you're gonna need a way to get back in to your teleport cluster because you don't have access to the auth service. You need a way to get back into your teleport cluster, logged in and correct the role mistakes. 
So make sure you have a backup local admin whenever you're doing RBAC changes on Teleport. Uh, again, this is something we touched on in session one, so I'll breeze through it. But when we look at Teleport RBAC and labeling, it all comes as we were talking about from role definitions where logins are defined that define access to the individual resources that are shown to a user based on the labels assigned to the resource and the labels permitted in the role. So it's all about resource labeling, label permissions in the role, and allowed logins for the various resources within that role, be it a database user, a Windows desktop user, or in this case, the example you see here is logins, which are for servers. And those labels, as we've already seen through various examples, can be static or dynamic. So you can have a very static label assigned to a resource. You can run commands to generate labels. And labels can be synced from the AWS cloud. So we can leverage cloud tagging as well and pull those into Teleport to use for our RBAC permissions. So let's dive into a little bit about some strategies with the auth connector, the first step of Teleport that you have control over within Teleport. Obviously, you'll want to talk to your IDP team or your SSO team to see what attributes and claims you'd like to pass to Teleport. Um, that's going to be configured on the IDP side. So make sure you know what's being passed. A great tip or trick is anytime you do an SSO login with Teleport, there is an SSO login audit event. If you go to the audit logs of Teleport in the web UI, even management audit logs, and look at the audit log for an SSO login for your user or a user you're testing with, you can see every attribute or claim Teleport saw with these specific values that were passed. So if you're ever curious what's coming from my IDP, take a look at an SSO login audit log and it will tell you what Teleport sees. This can be further affected by login rules, which is a new feature. We're not going to cover that in this session, but just know there is another way to manipulate those claims before they hit teleport called login rules. Now, getting into the strategies then that we're going to focus on for an auth connector is in teleport, what can we control is the attribute to role mapping or the claim to role mapping. That's taking what's coming from our IDP and mapping it to the teleport roles that are going to effectively apply the permissions. So some of the big things to keep in mind that will help you minimize duplication of attributes to roles and allow you to write a minimal number of statements so you don't end up with a 500 list of each role to each teleport is that first and foremost you can use regex mapping if you look at the examples on the slide right now at the bottom of it is an example of showing regex mapping the second to last example shows using wild cards to just map everybody to a single role but using wildcard mapping or using regex mapping can really help eliminate duplication of attribute to role claim or claims to roles, especially if you use a common name and schema between your teleport it claims and attributes that'll come from your IDP and the roles that you'd like to map them to. So a, again, a great example of that is what you see at the bottom where a value called admin one is being applied to him, or sorry, the role that's getting applied is admin one because the attribute coming from their SSO was SSH underscore admin underscore one. So in a real, you know, maybe a more real world focused example or another example, it's not uncommon if you have control over the claims and attributes that are gonna come to teleport, especially if you're making new groups specific for teleport to do something like teleport dash a, a name or a group name or, or some sort of indicator. And what comes after that dash aligns with your teleport role name. So then for all the groups you're gonna pass that mean something to teleport, you can have teleport dash, you can use a single basically attribute to role because it can be the value would be, you know, teleport regex and it will find anything that leads with teleport. And then the output of that can be the role value. So if you have five groups, you know, teleport dev, teleport prod, teleport, whatever, you know, your roles, as long as your name, prod, dev, and whatever, are going to map up. So using proper regex, wildcard mapping, and smart naming schemas between your roles and your IDP can really help reduce the complexity of your auth connector. And it's one of the things very much worth considering.
Last but not least, our final technical slide here and ad advice for RBAC is roll templates. But this is an important one because this can save you a lot of duplication on your teleport roles. Uh, teleport roles support interpolation, templatization, and can use the SSO claims and attributes and pull them into the role to minimize the duplication that you might have to do across many roles. So for example, let's kind of look at these examples we see on the right-hand side. Logins, that external dot logins, the external notation indicates, look at this user's claims or attributes that came from the SSO provider for a claim or attribute called logins. However, whatever value came under that login or logins claim or attribute will now become a valid login for that user inside Teleport for servers. That means if you control what users you expect them to have in your IDP, you don't have to write a specific role for the root user, the dev user, the prod user. That can all be combined into one role and we can rely on the list coming from your IDP to manage that. Same thing with uh, Kubernetes groups very popular to use the groups attribute that's coming and use that to map to either Kubernetes groups or labels that you have like a group label that identifies which group should have access to what. And then as long as in your IDP, you put them in the appropriate groups, a single teleport role would work for all of those use cases. Again, using these claims and attributes to your advantage minimizes the repetition of teleport roles and allows you to focus on unique access patterns that can be controlled by IDP versus having to repeat just because each user might need something unique to them. Um, so you really should kind of focus not on individuals, but on access patterns. Another great one to call out here from the example is what you see under the database section. External.email allows you to pull in the email address of an individual user. Email.local drops everything at and beyond. So it drops at in the domain, giving you the front of the user's email. This is very popular to use um, partially with database users, but especially with logins as well. We have create host user options where we can automatically create the user on the fly. That means you can use individual logins for each user. Again, without creating, if you have 100 users, you don't need 100 roles saying Ryan can be Ryan, Paul can be Paul. Database users, in this example, would only use what is the front of their email individually, all within a single role. Last but not least, we do have that regex replace that you see. That's a very powerful tool to take a claim. You run it through regex and basically replace pieces of it, look for certain matching criteria within that claim, and alter it so that when you look for the actual value of ENV, in this example, it'll be pulled out of that environment and yet, again, tied to the individual claims and attributes coming from the SSO. So if you have an organized SSO, the claims and attributes from there are going to help you be able to minimize role repetition because you can leverage this templatization and interpolation within your roles to minimize the access, um, minimize role duplication. Now I know this can is this is a very complex topic and it can be highly individual to each user's environment. So the last point I'll bring up is that everyone um, as a Teleport customer has access to a one-time sync with our implementation team. You should have seen it on our landing page um, as available uh, for you to run through a quick survey and then schedule your sync. This is a great way to get a chance to talk with an IE about this, this topic. This is probably one of our most top popular topics is our back strategy. So if you're still confused or you have more questions around your unique environments that uh, you don't want to bring up today, please feel free to schedule that sync and we'll be happy to help you. So appreciate you sticking with me today. As we wrap up here, I'll let you a little, know a little bit more about our next session. The session three is going to be advanced integrations and security features. We're going to cover access requests for just-in-time access how to use our Terraform provider, go over machine ID use cases, how to use Teleport with MFA, active session joining, device trust, all of these great security features and management features that will allow you to 
stay on top of teleport, stay secure, and make sure that your upgrades are happening pretty smoothly. So we got a stacked list of, I think, some advanced features and functionalities coming next week. Um, so please be, uh, please go ahead and join us for that. And uh, we look forward to seeing you there. I'll pause once more to see if any further questions are coming through. All right, that's it then for today. Thank you. Again, we look forward to seeing you at the next uh, enablement session here. Please don't forget to sign up for your one-time sync we just talked about. If you still want to have more discussions or have some unanswered questions, we're happy to help. And uh, we'll see you next time for some advanced uh, security and integrations. Thank you, everyone.